Have you ever wondered what experienced investors do to avoid bad syndication deals? Well, on this episode, I'm about to share the number one secret on how to do just that. Spoiler alert, it's all about finding a good sponsor. Hello, passive investors, and welcome to Passive Pockets, the passive real estate investing show. I'm your host, Jim Pfeiffer. If you're new to the show, thanks for being here. If you were a listener of Passive Investing from Left Field, welcome back. As a reminder, Passive Pockets is not just a podcast, but also a community with access to educational resources, private investor forums, and comprehensive sponsor and deal directories, and so much more. Make sure to visit www.passivepockets.com to learn more. On today's episode, I'm bringing on two giants in the passive investing space, Mauricio Raul and Jeremy Roll. Mauricio is a lawyer and a limited partner who specializes in real estate syndication law. Jeremy Roll is an experienced LP and president of Roll Investments. On today's episode, you're going to learn what Mauricio and Jeremy look for when they're contemplating investing with a new sponsor. You're going to hear recommendations on how to vet a new sponsor. You're going to hear due diligence you should complete in order to make sure the deal and the sponsor are sound. And lastly, you'll hear about some red flags and things to avoid in a sponsor. Let's bring on Jeremy and Mauricio. Mauricio, Jeremy, welcome to Passive Pockets. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Jim. It's always great to be here with you. Hey, I'm really excited about this. You guys are both past guests on Passive Investing from Left Field, and we're super excited to have you kind of give us a back to basics episode on sponsors at the uh, Passive Pockets podcast. So I'm going to start out with a little bit of introductions of who you are, where you came from. Jeremy, I'd love to start with you. When and why did you first start investing in real estate syndications? So I started investing passively in 2002, quite a while ago now, 22 years ago. And um, that was in response to the dot-com crash for anybody who's old enough to remember that. I was investing in stocks and bonds. I was working in the corporate world. I was actually working at Disney headquarters at the time in Los Angeles. And I was just watching the stock market go up and down 30%, like the dot-com crash and just the wrong fit for me. So I started to look at different ways to invest and came across the concept of more predictability for what I was looking for. And that's kind of what I found in, in cash flow. And so I started to take a look at uh, passive real estate cash flowing opportunities back then and then started to dip my toe in it in early 2002. Excellent. And Mauricio, I, I know you're an attorney and you were involved in syndications as an attorney. And before that, you were an asset protection attorney. So how did you get into the LP position investing in syndications? Yeah, I'm an attorney, but don't hold that against me. You know, I'm not your your typical lawyer. I'm not that boring. Um, one of the few lawyers that actually speaks in English, as you guys know. Yeah, I've been practicing for 25 years, and I got into the syndication world by actually representing sponsors, the, the, the folks that are putting together these syndications for the benefit of LPs, limited partners like, like you and Jeremy. So that's kind of how I got introduced to it. I started investing in real estate actually in 2007. I, I don't know if I could have picked a worse year to do that, but that's kind of where I bought my first condo in Las Vegas in 2007. Lost my shirt. I, lo I learned a lot in the 2008, 2009 crisis. Thing. And then I just realized, hey, I've got a business to run. I have a law firm. I, I represent clients. I'm going to start investing passively. And so since then, I've been really an LP in a lot of these real estate uh, syndications. And so that's kind of where my experience experience begins, really, because I'm representing most of these syndicators. This episode, we're going to focus on sponsors and evaluating sponsors, vetting sponsors. So the first question I'd like to ask, Mauricio, we'll, we'll start with you. You know, How do you find new sponsors? Do you go to conferences? Is it word of mouth? You know, your community? I understand that you're working for a lot of these. So is that kind of how you find them? Yeah, I'm in a little bit of a unique situation, obviously, because I am, I represent all of these sponsors. I mean, we have, you know, we have about 400 clients. So, and, and I run a, a big community of real estate syndicators. So I'm probably not the best sort of example of how to find sponsors. I think the best way to do that is to go to these conferences, go to meetups, go, go be active in the community, whether it's online, whether it's in person, whether it's however it is, but you've got to get out there and meet people. But I think Jeremy, you being the, the pro of the LP and not having the situation I have, how do you typically find uh, investors? Yeah, when I first started in Investing back in 2002 is a whole different landscape. Honestly, now it's a lot easier than it used to be to find sponsors, to find opportunities to network. Um, networking is absolutely key in this space if you want to be able to find opportunities and even discuss with other passive investors, maybe get feedback on other sponsors. I consider this a team sport. 
And so really all of the resources out there, including conferences, podcasts to listen to new sponsors to hear, you know, their perspective on things, which can be really good and like listening to a lot of details about them, online forums like Passive Pockets, all different types of things. There's a lot of stuff out there and you can do a lot of it in your pajamas now, which is really great. You can do it all from home. It's fantastic to be able to do this all virtually, but how important is it to either one of you to kind of step out and, and meet them in person before you invest, to shake their hand and kind of take the measure or ha- have a meal with them? Is that is that important or can, can you really do it with the well, as you said, in your pajamas. So I think you could do a lot of preliminary work in your pajamas and at least locate some sponsors you may want to talk to and other things and you know just all on the computer. I have a personal requirement for myself that I won't invest with someone unless I've met them in person at least once. And that's more of you know a subjective thing in terms of a gut feel. I just learned along the way that, I mean, there are times where I was on a, literally on an airplane to go meet someone across the country thinking, I don't know about this person. I don't really know if I want to invest with them. But then by the end of the meeting, I got a really good gut feel for them. It it went much better than I expected. I'm going to move forward. And it's actually been vice versa as well. I'm a very big fan of meeting someone in person at least once. I know that may not be feasible for everybody listening to this, but if that's possible, it really has helped me over the years. Just to add to that, I mean, there's one thing to find new sponsors, and that's kind of, I think, going to conferences. But then before you actually invest in a new sponsor, I think that's the next level of due diligence that you're going to be doing. I don't think you can do that by just, you know, meeting some somebody on a, on a Facebook uh, community page or something like that. But uh, once you've made the decision that, hey, I want to invest in something like this, I want to be a passive investor in a deal, and you've identified a couple of sponsors, then you go into the vetting process, which I think is really, really important. Yeah, and I think it is important, and it gives me a sense of relief to meet someone in person and, and see that they are who they said they are. But I also like to use my community because it's not possible for me to go meet every sponsor prior to investing. And, and you know, I really respect Jeremy and the way he does things, but some of those things other people can't do. Maybe they have a W-2 and, and they just they just don't have the time or the money to do that. So I think also what I do is use the community and, and say, hey, is anybody in the community uh, invested with this operator then, and then have that conversation? But what I want to um, focus on for now was when you're evaluating a new sponsor, what's the first thing that you do or the first thing you look for? Well, the, the really the first, first really basic thing, even before getting into the sort of the experience and track record, which is really the, the really main thing. But I just want to make sure that, you know, the sponsor and my investment philosophy are aligned. Right. Because if I'm a cash flow investor or whatever, and I, I'm looking for cash flow, for example, I want to make sure that the sponsor that I'm talking to is also into cash flow. Because if they're a ground up development uh, person, for example, who loves to, to, to build new things and not have cash flow for the next 18 or 24 months, that's not going to be a good fit for me. Or if I really love, you know, A class multifamily investing and this person's in, you know, C class mobile home parks or something like that. Like, so we want to make sure that our interests are aligned. Because uh, to me, that's always at the top is, you know, what is your, you know, personal investment philosophy, that's kind of always at the top of my pyramid. And then I want to make sure that the sponsors also personal investment philosophy aligns and matches with mine. That's one of the things I messed up on at the beginning, right? When I first got into this, I was just so excited to go, go, go. I started investing in development deals and other things like that. And then I realized, oh, wait a second, I don't have a W-2, I need cash flow. So I changed and, and made sure I was matching them up. But go ahead, Jeremy, what's the first thing you look for in a sponsor when you're when you're chatting with them? Yeah, well, I just want to add to what Marisa said. I think I think Marisa made a really good point. And like when I'm thinking of a holistically high level, if you can get your hands on a op, like an offering memorandum or a business plan, and then just look high level, what am I even investing in? So you're going to look at the business plan itself, which is what Marisa was talking about. Is it a ten year deal? Is it a three year deal? Is it a one month deal? Is it value add? Is it stabilized? All these other factors. Is it does it actually? fit within your box, right? Defining your box, I think is very important. In other words, what are you targeting? And then at the same time, though, it could be that all of that fits in your box, but you're looking at the return profile and the cash flow isn't hitting the needs you have for every dollar that you want to invest, for example. Or it could be meeting the general profile, but the specific location that it's in, you don't agree with, whether it's because there's net migration in or out, or maybe you're afraid because it's a hurricane area. There's a lot of detail we can get into. So I think from a high level, getting a hold of that um, business plan or that uh, summary and looking at it is really important to review it from you know all different aspects. To, to, that's just a preliminary first look. I almost think of the deal as sort of the last thing on the totem pole, right? So it's like the personal investment philosophy is the most important thing for me. I want to make sure we're aligned. Then the next thing is what Jeremy talked about is like the market. Like, you know, what market are you interested in? Like, hopefully you've done a little bit of due diligence and there are certain markets that you like, but you might love the, you know, the DFW for, I'm just throwing them random uh, plates out there, but I may love Dallas and this person's investing in, in Idaho or 
some other market that you either don't know about or don't really like. So I always think that the market is the second part uh, of my sort of four part framework. Uh, the third part is the team, which I know we're going to get to in a second, but like who is a team, not only in the sponsor world, but also the team on the ground, like who's the broker, who's the agent, who's, you know, all, all the, t- the, the boots on the ground. And then the last thing is sort of the deal. Like it's almost like the deal could be more interchangeable. Obviously at some point you want to look at the deal, the returns and what, what, what the assumptions are, but I would start more high level and go with personal investment philosophy, market, team, and then the deal. We do have to take a quick break, but more from Jeremy and Mauricio when we return. Welcome back to Passive Pockets. Let's jump back in. Let's talk about the team because we've talked about the first two a little bit. There's limited partners, which are the investors. That's what that's what we are. And then there's general partners, which is also, you know, some people call it an operator, deal provider, syndicator. There's a bunch of different terms there. But can you talk about how do you evaluate the partners or the team that the operator has? Because there, sometimes there's one person, sometimes there's two, three. And then you mentioned a, a bunch of others, the, the, the other people in it, the brokers and stuff. So, Mauricio, maybe we start with you. Can you kind of talk about the team? If you're a limited partner looking to invest in a syndication of deal, the sponsor is the main thing. Vetting the sponsor, figuring out do they have the necessary experience to pull off the fancy business plan. They're, they're going to give you a business plan. They give you a pitch deck. They're going to show you what the sort of the game plan is. But does the sponsor really have the the level of expertise and experience to pull that off? So that's something I'm really, really focused on. Their track record, for example. Have they done these kind of deals before? And and I like to get a little bit more nuanced, too, because I want to know not only do they have a track record and the experience, but do they have the track record and experience in this particular asset class, for example? Because I see a lot of folks that are sort of experts in a particular asset class. Maybe it's uh, multifamily, for example. That's that's probably where most of my clients are. Uh, But this particular deal, they may be venturing into mobile homes, for example, or self-storage. And it's like, okay, well, I know you have a lot of experience in multifamily, but do you have experience, do you have a track record, or do you have somebody on your team that has an experience in that particular uh, asset class? And similarly with the marketplace, like the, the, you know, the, the, there may be a lot of experience in a particular market. Maybe, again, they're, they're experts in the Dallas market, but this particular investment happens to be in, in Orlando, in, in Florida. Like, what's the level of experience they have in that particular market? How well do they know that market? So really digging, drilling down a bit on the nuances of, of their track record. And again, and not only the track or the person that you're actually speaking with, but also who's actually going to be running the day-to-day operations of your deal. Because a lot of times you have multiple sponsors. It's something that's very common these days where instead of having one operator or one sponsor, you might have six, right? So you might be talking to somebody, you might be really impressed with a particular sponsor. You may know, like, and trust a particular sponsor. But once you make the investment, that sponsor really isn't involved very much in the day-to-day and somebody else is actually doing the day-to-day asset management and, and running the show. What's their level of experience and how comfortable are you that they're running your investment? Mariso, actually, you covered a lot of really good and important points. I want to add that for anyone who's relatively new to this, I cannot stress the importance of the team more. In fact, I would say that the team is you know, slightly more important than the actual opportunity itself. Like The opportunity is clearly a very close second place, no doubt. But when you're investing these types of opportunities, they're e-liquid. You are making a bet on people to execute and operate a certain way. You can literally invest in the best property in downtown Beverly Hills on the best street. And if someone runs into a ground, it did not matter where that property was or that it was 100% occupied. It's going to go back to the bank. You're going to lose your money. And the fact that you are making bet on people in a liquid opportunity means that you can't just sell your shares very easily. And so, and you know, you can't go on the stock market and press sell and have your cash in two or three days. And so you really, really have to prioritize the team even over the deal when you're trying to figure out who you want to make a bet on in this type of investing. I just wanted to point that out because I think it's so important. Once you do all of that work, I think as a limited partner, that's where you should focus most, if not all of your preliminary research is on the sponsor, on that team. But the nice thing about it is once you've come to, once you've done that work and you're comfortable with a particular sponsor, you only have to do that once, right? Now you have a deal, that person brings you a deal, you invest in the deal, maybe in six months they have a second deal. Well, yeah, I don't have to go from, you know, from scratch and do all that research on the uh, on the operators that's the only thing you're looking at really is to me is the team and the operator that's that's going to be number one in your process and once you're comfortable with that then start looking at the deal itself but again to me the deal is secondary yeah i completely agree with that and one one thing i do want to ask is you know experience now is different than experience was three or four years ago right there there were very few operators that went through 2006 7 8 9 right when when things were really tough And now, and going forward, almost every operator will have gone through this difficult time. So, Jeremy, does that change your evaluation and how you vet sponsors? Is it going to be, you know, easier now that everyone's gone through some troubled times? I actually think it's going to be harder. I'm going to 
answer this under the assumption that we may be going into a recession and a full cycle reset, because that's my personal, you know, uh, base case opinion about what we're going through in the next 12 to 24 months. And assuming we have that, and then we start a new up cycle, essentially, my concern right now is that there's a lot of distress out there that may get worse. And as those sponsors deal with distress that they may be having in, in deals that they're operating, there could end up being foreclosures. But there, I have two concerns about this distress. Number one is distraction, which means that, you know, it's going to be imperative for me to understand if an operator is completely distracted by two, three, four, ten deals that they're in, that they're trying to figure out that are in a level of distress. And what that means is that they're going to be able to focus less on the deal I'm about to invest in. And also, am I investing in a deal of theirs that is earning them an acquisition fee because they're having distress in 10 other deals and they're trying to figure out how to keep the lights on because they're not earning a management fee in these other properties because the property isn't cash flowing. I'm just making this up, of course. So there's a lot to consider on that in terms of who you're making about on at that exact timing coming up. And the other thing is that I learned this in the last cycle. So I've actually only been in ever in one foreclosure in the 22 years. And it was actually unrelated to 2008, 2009. But I was in one in 2011. It was one of those like 1% risk stories, which we can get into. But what I learned from that, one of the many things I learned from that is that once that sponsor got foreclosed, because that, that wasn't their fault. And so the next deal that I saw of theirs, the interest rate was higher for the exact same type of deal compared to all the other sponsors that I saw. And that's because of the foreclosure. And now all of a sudden, I'm having to make a decision for myself. Do I want to make a bet on this person, even if I think they're a great sponsor, where I'm going to earn less of a return for the same amount of risk? By the way, if they have to refinance or whatever it is in the future, that's also a risk. So that's another factor you really have to watch out for going into a new cycle and potentially at the end of a cycle reset. So Jim, I think it's actually going to be harder to evaluate people. Um, and, and that's not even counting, I think, for some of the point you were trying to make about some of these sponsors are new and they haven't been through a cycle. How are they going to manage through that? There's a, there's a lot to really consider who you're making a bet on coming up. One counterpoint to that, because I do think, just to pull it back a little bit, especially if somebody's just thinking about investing uh, in, a, in a past investment for the first time, is that I do think you have a lot more data available to you now than you did, you know, five years ago, like five years ago, everybody was doing great. You could literally throw a dart at, at a board and you're going to be successful. Even if you had a sponsor that didn't really do a very good job, they were getting bailed out because prices were going up. They could have completely failed their business plan. They could have not increased rents. They could have not gotten the net operating income up. They could have literally failed, but because the market appreciated 10, 20, 30%, they ended up, you know, looking like they did, had an amazing return. Now that we've gone through this, so we're still in the middle of the cycle, uh, I think it's going to be easier for us to track down past investors from these sponsors. Like, especially in some of these communities like like your community gym and now passive pockets there are a lot of communities that are full of limited partners who have experience with multiple uh, sponsors and i think getting it's going to be a lot easier to get feedback of hey how do they handle this this particular uh, time that we're going on a lot of people a lot of sponsors have done a terrible job of keeping their lps informed of communicating with them you know just just keeping them informed i think a lot of that's going to be something that they're going to take into account for the next deal so i think you just have more data available to you if you're a new a new person or somebody coming in uh, after this uh, thing because you, you've got a track record and before you didn't you just had everybody doing great but you didn't really know if they were doing great because they were lucky or they were doing great because they were really good i think that those are fantastic answers because you can take both of them and use both of them in your evaluations of you know when you're trying to to look at sponsors. And so one of the questions is when, when you're looking at, and I know we're not talking about a specific deal, so we're talking about the general, hey, I'm betting the sponsor. Do you look at, or how do you look at the returns um, that they, they, they'd have in their pro formas? Are you looking for conservative returns, realistic assumptions? Like what are some of the things, do you dig into maybe a prior deal to say, okay, I want to see how they projected and, and maybe you, you can see how it went, but probably probably not at this point because maybe it's in the middle of a deal. So what kind of deal-related documents are you looking at? I think there's two questions. The number one for the returns, I personally am looking for someone who's matching my personality, which means that they're looking to under-promise and over-deliver to build long-term relationships with investors so they're conservative, in other words. And I'm trying to avoid someone who is using very aggressive assumptions, possibly with very nice marketing materials to attract investors, maybe even a lot of social media and other types of marketing to attract people. And they don't really care how the deal performs as much because they just have such a big network and they just have almost like a marketing funnel. They're just going to go on to the next investor and they're not, they don't have to count on building that long-term relationship as much. And so when I'm looking at some of the projections, just looking at some of the assumptions and everything, it really starts to speak to me. Even sometimes the verbiage that people use 
to like justify a vacancy rate if you're talking to them or even reading the summary to understand if they're conservative or aggressive. And I can give examples if it's helpful. But as far as documents go, I think that you asked about Jim as well. Obviously, you're going to want to take a look at the business plan or what's also known as the overview. And generally speaking in this space, what's called the offering documents is all the documents that are kind of comprised of the business plan. You'll typically have something called the PPM or private placement memorandum that Mauricio, our attorney, can give us better information on than me. But you're going to want to take a look at that to understand the risks, some of the fee disclosures, some other important points. And then you, you're also going to want to take a look at the operating agreement. And for those of you who are new to this space, but maybe own a business or have seen businesses, that's the typical operating agreement that's associated with an LLC, meaning a business. And that is extremely important. And I find, unfortunately, that a lot of passive investors don't necessarily read the operating agreement that thoroughly because it's a long legal document. But why it's so important is because it dictates the rules that both the sponsor has to follow, but also that uh, relate to the investor. So there could be voting rules, cash call rules. About reporting requirements, cash distribution requirements, and all kinds of other stuff. And Marisa could probably give us more information. And if you're not reading that in advance, what you're doing is you're blindly going into a deal that you literally don't understand the rules of that you have to be abide by for yourself. And if something goes wrong, how do you vote the sponsor out, for example? You don't even know that rule and you may not be comfortable with it. There are a lot of times where I'm not comfortable with the cash call rules, for example, and I pass strictly because of that. As difficult it is, as it is for people to get through those legal documents, sometimes I think they're absolutely imperative. I'm sure Mauricio has more for us on this. To go back to the first point, I think one of the biggest mistakes a lot of LPs made in this last cycle was just purely looking at returns and comparing two deals just based on the return. They would see two offerings and say, well, wait a minute, this deal says that they're going to return 15% annualized, but this one's going to return 20. Like, why would I not invest in the one, the 20? And I think what people overlooked was this idea of risk adjusted return. You shouldn't really be looking at the absolute return of a deal. It's like the risk adjusted return. And that comes with this, how conservative their underwriting is. And one of my pet peeves throughout this whole time is that everyone says that their underwriting is conservative. It's like to the point where like, if you say it's conservative, it's not conservative, it's just normal because everybody's conservative, right? Jeremy can speak a lot better to me of like, how do you actually figure out what's conservative or not? But you can certainly, you can make numbers do whatever you want them to do just based on the assumptions that, that you put into them. You know, what, what's the price of your property? You know, what's, what's the cap rate going to be when you decide to sell in five or seven years? What's the occupancy going to be? What's the, I mean, you can make so many assumptions. Uh, and I think a lot of people were making sort of aggressive assumptions where they just figured, hey, the property was going to go up a certain amount or the, just the way the underwriting. And Jeremy, you can talk a lot more about the underwriting part of conservative. But, but I just want to be very cautious that not all deals should be reviewed purely on the returns. There is something referred to as risk adjust return. And, and just because one deal pays more than the other is not it's probably the last reason you want to be investing in one deal over the other. And Mauricio, do you want to touch on the documents? I know Jeremy said, you know, read them thoroughly and that, that makes complete sense. But it's also you know, daunting. The the first, you know, 40 pages are all caps like someone's screaming at you. And a lot of it is likely boilerplate. So how do you filter through to find the stuff that, that you really need to know rather than, you know, just the stuff that uh, I think lawyers are paid by the word, right? So they're throwing all kinds of extra stuff in there, it seems. Yeah. So just so if, if nobody's familiar, let me just, just give you the, the 30 second version. So there, there are disclosure documents that sponsors are required to provide their investors that they're called I call them offering documents, right? And they're usually comprised of really five documents. So I'll just walk them real quick. One is the PPM, which is the private placement memorandum. That is a document that discloses all of the risks involved in the deal, all the ways a deal can go wrong, all the skeletons in the sponsor's closets, all the disclosures, everything that would make it relevant to, to an investor making a decision, that's going to go in that document. The second document is the operating agreement, as Jeremy mentioned. Uh, it is really the, the rules and regulations of the company. So people always call me or email me and say, Mauricio, how do I do a cash call? Or how do I do this? Or how do I vote a ma manager off? Or can I do this? Or can I do that? All of that information is, is in that operating agreement. So those are the rules of the game. So that's a very, very important document you want to look at. Then there's the, the subscription agreement, which is the third document, which is actually the legal document that binds the investor to the agreement. That's where they say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm investing $50,000, $100,000, $25,000. Here's all my information. There's a questionnaire that also appears, which is the sort of the fourth document because sponsors need to track you know, how many investors they have and are they accredited, not, not accredited. We can get into that in, in a different episode. And the last document is usually the business plan. So that, that pitch deck or business plan that we talked about earlier, that's kind of your last one. Uh, but it can be overwhelming because 
because I mean, by the time we're done with all those documents, you're probably looking at about 150 to 200 pages of legal documents. And so it is a little bit overwhelming. I think most people don't even read them, to be honest with you. I mean, I know Jeremy does. Jeremy picks it apart. Uh, it's, what's interesting, actually, is people are starting to pay attention to provisions that Jeremy's been paying attention to this all the time, but some of the newer investors have not been. So, for example, the cash call provision, which, Jeremy, you brought up, there's been so many cash calls going on in, this, in the last 12 to 18 months that now people are focusing on the cash call, right? They go back to the, their existing operating agreement to see what, what are the steps or what are the, how does a cash call procedure work? And now they're like, wait a minute, I don't like that procedure. I don't like how that's worded. I don't like the fact that I'm going to get diluted. So now moving forward, they're actually paying a lot more attention to, 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 that, uh, to that thing. The waterfall is obviously a big one. I mean, you want to make sure that whatever the sponsor is promising you in terms of splits with your investors is or a preferred return, that's all going to be in the waterfall. But I think, Jeremy, you, you're, always, you're always harping on, on the provisions of the cash call. I know that's a big one for you. Uh, and I know you're, you're big on this indemnification provision, too. I mean, that's a little, a little bit too much in the weeds. Uh, that's something I know you pay a lot of attention to, mean, meaning if, if something doesn't go well, are the investors going to basically be paying for the defense of the sponsor? If they didn't do something right, if there's a lawsuit against the sponsor, or if there's a regulatory inquiry from the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, who pays those lawyer fees? And in a lot of documents... It's going to be the company, which by, by definition is going to be the LPs. And I just want to say that, um, just to add to what Mauricio said, reading legal documents can be daunting. I actually don't enjoy doing it. I just think it's an absolute necessity before I invest. That being said, uh, the good news about legal documents is that the operating agreements and the PPMs tend to be, formulaic is the wrong word, but they tend to be very similar across attorneys. And it's because they're covering similar material. They have similar goals each time. And so once you start to read a few and you get comfortable with them, You'll start to become, it'll be much less daunting because you'll, you'll possibly even create a checklist for yourself in terms of what do I want, at the minimum, what do I want to look for? Do I want to look for the cash calls? Do I want to look for the reporting requirements? Do I want to look for all these other things? And um, if you don't see them in there, that's actually good to know because that means there are no rules, which is also can be a, a big challenge. But my point being is that it does get less daunting over time. So, but it is absolutely imperative to take a look at before you, you move forward. Yeah, Jeremy, you just mentioned reporting. That's another big issue we've had over the last 12 to 18 months uh, because investors are getting frustrated and not getting the proper reporting. They don't know what's going on. They, they, they've stopped receiving some distributions. They don't, you know, they're just, they're, they're, some of these investments are in trouble, uh, but the reporting and the communication hasn't been up to par. So people are starting to focus on that provision as well. What, how often are, is the sponsor communicating? What type of communications are they giving you? Are they just giving you a two-line email once a quarter or do they give you a nice thorough report with your profit and loss statement, so to speak? and how much money you made, how, what the occupancy levels were. Uh, how is it comparing with the pro forma? Because everybody puts together a, a pro forma, which is how they think the deal is going to go. Uh, I think the best sponsors I've seen will actually do sort of a side-by-side, -side, say, look, this is what we thought it was going to be, and here's how we actually are performing, and we can see whether we're you know, above trend or below trend. I think that's something not, that's a nice thing to see from a sponsor versus somebody that just communicates you know, whenever they want to communicate. Sorry, Jim, I know we're, we're making this a long point, but just one more very important thing. So as much as I like Mauricio, he's a really good guy. He lives like a half an hour away from me, so I see him every so often. He is hired by the sponsor. He does not represent the investors, okay? And so the reason why it's so critical to read these documents is because the person who created the documents, literally the attorney, is hired by the other side. And you have to make sure you agree with the provisions because some attorneys will try to create balanced documents. But let me tell you, some of them don't. And I've seen the whole gamut. And there are some times where a lot of the provisions are just not fair to the LPs and it's not balanced. But hey, that attorney was not necessarily hired to create a balance. It's, it's there to kind of serve the sponsor who is their client. So just keep that in mind. That's why reading these illegal documents is so important because there are some protections in there for investors, but they were not created for investors. They're created for the sponsor to give to investors. We do have to take one final break to hear a word from our sponsors, but stick with us. We have more on vetting sponsors when we come back. Welcome back to the show. I think we could go probably a couple episodes with you two on the on just the uh, documents because, you know, Mauricio creates them and I know Jeremy picks them apart. And Jeremy is one of the only investors I know who actually goes back to the operator and says, hey, can you change these 42 things? And the operator generally says, I'll change 40 of them, but the other two maybe not. So Jeremy is, is one of the few, the only person I've heard of doing that. But I also want to address a couple of things you guys said. You talked about a cash call. And just for the new people here, cash call is the same as a capital call. And what that is, is if the deal is perhaps not going to plan and it's in danger of you know, giving it back to the bank, the operator might call capital and say, hey, 
everybody, you got to invest 10, 20, 30 more percent of what your original investment was or whatever the number is. And sometimes it's mandatory, sometimes it's optional, and it's always the LP's decision on whether they want to participate that. We won't get into the weeds on that. Also, uh, Mauricio mentioned a waterfall, and that, again, we don't want to get into the weeds in this episode. We'll be talking about it later, but it is in the documents, and it says how you get paid as an LP. So that is certainly something you're going to want to look at. Lastly, the question I want to ask out of this, I think, Mauricio, you mentioned communication. And communication is probably the single most important thing to me when picking an operator, you know, after experiencing some of those other things. And I like to test them out and make sure that their communication is adequate before I invest. So the question to both of you is, what do you do to test and make sure that, hey, this operator is going to be the kind that will communicate effectively with me? This raises a very good question because let me tell you, I network with a lot of limited partner investors because it's the team sport and it's really important to do. And let me tell you, the number of times I have heard someone complain about the lack of detail they're receiving from a sponsor, and yet they didn't ask the sponsor for a sample quarterly report that they create before investing with them. To me, the onus is on the investor to check these things out before they invest because again, like I talked about before, once you're in a deal, it's very liquid and you're locked into what you actually invested in for the most part. And so you've got to add it onto your list of things to check. And Jim, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up in advance. I guess for the most recent quarter, right? Just so we see like, what is the most recent reporting you're doing? Sometimes the sponsors will be like, no problem. Here's a sample. Here's one, right? And of course, you've got to keep in mind that they're going to probably take a well-performing property. So don't pay any attention to like how that property is performing. Pay more attention to with the content that's in there. Okay. But sometimes I'll actually get a sponsor because of confidentiality rules that all the investors are agreeing to that won't provide you with a sample report. They'll actually redact a lot of it, meaning they'll black it out. Then it's a little harder to kind of get a sense of what you're going to see. It's still probably pretty valuable though, because you'll be able to tell, is it a page? Is it 10 pages? What are the sections? What am I going to get? Even that is quite valuable alone, but please do yourself a favor and make sure you ask to see a sample report before you invest. And another thing too, this is one of those many examples that if you ask for a sample report and they refuse to give you one, walk on to the next sponsor. I've had that happen a couple of times. And like, there's no good reason for that. If they say, oh, it's confidential, just say, well, I can't invest with somebody without seeing what I'm going to get in reporting. But there's enough deals out there. Don't take risks on stuff like that. It's just not worth it because of the nature of these investments being very illiquid. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think samples is, is just the easiest way to do it. I mean, you just ask, right? I will want to emphasize one point that, that Jeremy brought up before, which is I, I will disagree with the statement that, you know, when Jeremy has 42 changes, you know, we'll change 40 of them. Generally, these are take it or leave it type deal. So when you look at the operating agreement, you say, wait, or you look at these samples and you say, well, I don't really like the way they're doing it. You know, I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like for you to change that. Or I'd like you to do a better reporting. Just know that they're, unless you're coming in with like half the capital and you're bringing in a million, like if you're going to bring in a million dollars or $2 million, fine, they'll probably work with you. But if you're just coming in with a minimum investment or a smaller, the, the normal investment, if you don't like what you see, you're, you just have to move on to the next one because they're not going to change their uh, documents just for one one investor. Obviously, if there's an error, if there's something in there that, hey, it's supposed to be 8% preferred return and it says seven, then yes, that'll be changed. But if it's something because Jeremy doesn't like the uh, the way that uh, the reporting is, uh, uh, that then he just can, he, it's up to him to make the decision whether he wants to invest or not based on what we've given him. I just want to add, you know, Maurice, you bring up a good, really good point because there are definitely times where somebody will say, I'm not changing this. And sometimes it's because they believe those are fair cash call provisions, for example, and they just don't think they need to change them. One of the challenges with these documents sometimes is that they're, they're done at a very high level and they're actually done in a very high level without much detail purposely to give flexibility to the sponsor because again, the sponsor hires the attorneys. And so for example, I'll give a really easy example. I want reporting to come within 60 days of the close of a quarter. That, I think that's quite reasonable. Some spit people may even want it 30 or 45 days after the close of a quarter. And I sometimes will be on the phone with a sponsor who tells me that they send their reports prior to 60 days of the close of the quarter. Then you pull up the operating agreement and it just says that, that investors will receive reporting. I forget the exact verbiage, but like on a time over time basis or something like that, Marisa could probably give us the exact verbiage. What that means is that if I have to hold someone their feet to the fire, they actually don't legally have to give me a report theoretically at any specific time. Right. And so I might then call up that sponsor and say, Hey, I know you told me you give reports within 60 days of the close of the quarter, but it's not in your operating agreement. Can you add it in? Sometimes the sponsor will be like, no problem. We do that. I don't know why it's not in there because honestly, sometimes the sponsors don't read all the documents themselves. And sometimes they'll say, well, my attorney 
said this is the right verbiage, right? And then you have to make a decision for yourself as an investor, as a passive investor. Am I comfortable taking the risk that I can hold this sponsor's feet to the fire and that I just have to take their word for the fact that I'm going to get that report within 60 days of the close of the quarter? That's a judgment call, but that's a risk for sure. I will say, uh, Mauricio, you are correct that you know most people aren't going to be able to get those changes in, in, the, in the operating agreement. But if you're as dialed into the industry and have those relationships that you know Mauricio, you do, or Jeremy, that you do, you might be able to at least have those discussions. And I think those discussions are worthwhile. The one thing I would say about communication, one thing that I like to do is regardless if I have questions or not, I'm going to send an email with some questions to the operator just to test them to see, are you going to respond to me within you know 24 hours or a reasonable amount of time or give me a reason why you didn't? Because if you're not going to do that before I send you the wire for 50 grand, you certainly aren't going to do that after you have my money. So that's something that is important to me. Got a couple more questions before we wrap up. And the first one, Jeremy, I know that you sometimes or often do background checks on your sponsors. Has this ever stopped you from moving further in, an, in your evaluation? And can you briefly talk a little bit about the background check process? Yes, sir, Jim. So I'm actually going to switch that to always, not sometimes or often. It is mandatory for me. And in fact, it's interesting because Mauricio made a comment earlier about how, you know, your due diligence is all up front with the sponsor the first time. But in fact, I actually rerun background checks every time I'm investing with a sponsor. Now, if I'm doing a deal a month later, I probably won't. But if it's just a few months later, I'm going to rerun it. Because when you do these background checks, they're pulling up court cases, liens, judgments, bankruptcies, other issues. You know, you invest with someone today, something can happen tomorrow, right? But I consider these mandatory. Um, to Jim's point, I have ap- definitely been saved several times by running these background checks, and that's why I consider it mandatory. Sometimes it's quite obvious when you run a background check on somebody, and unfortunately, they're just not a good person. I mean, there was one time where I met somebody through a friend, and I was doing due diligence on them, and I, I did a background check, and they used to live in Oregon, and then they had like 40 individual lawsuits or so against them in Oregon, but none in California, and they happen to live here now. And, and it actually happened in a previous state before for that. And literally this person's going around scamming people from state to state. You can see it in the background check. I think one very important point with background checks though, you know, if you're a low risk person like me, it's not worth taking a risk on someone who's somewhat questionable. If there's something that's somewhat questionable in the background check, you, you have a choice. You can either ask them to clarify it and see what they say and then make a decision, or you can simply pass because it's not worth the risk. That's something you have to decide. But I will say that unfortunately, this is one of those things that I find most individual investors don't do as background checks, but it is so worth the money, especially for the amount of money you're going to invest. And for those of you who don't have access to like more sophisticated background check software, um, you can hire private investigators, PIs, who literally have access to the software and just kind of run it on your behalf, may help interpret it a little bit for you. It's money well spent because it could save you tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. I would venture to say, to your point, Jeremy, most limited partners do not do that level of background check. They don't even really Google, you know, I, I would say at least Google and go past the first couple pages, go deep into the Google because yeah, Google's pretty good these days and they can pick up a lot of court cases, but it's not going to be to the level of these uh, civil and criminal background checks. The challenge I think is just cost, right? I mean, if you're investing $50,000 and the sponsor team, there's seven people and you have to run background checks on seven people and each background check is, you tell me, Jeremy, but if you're going to hire a private investigator, it's probably a thousand bucks. So now I'm spending $7,000 on a $50,000 investment. It's just, it makes it tough to do that. Yeah. And Marisa, you make a good point. So to be fair, I haven't hired a PI in literally over 15 years because I got access to more sophisticated background check software, which is kind of hard to get access. You have to real company, a real office location. It's not so easy. So I don't know what the cost would be today. I remember paying $150. That was the last time it was probably call it in like 2004, five, six. Okay. So it's probably substantially more now to your point. And I can't remember if it was on one person or not, but you make a good point. I will say if you get access to the software, I typically only pay maybe 10 or $20 per person that I run. But it is expensive because if I don't run checks on anybody in a month, there is a minimum cost to just even have access to the software and it's expensive. Mauricio, to your point, if it's too expensive and the cost benefit isn't there, obviously don't do it. But at the very least, if you're new to this, look into all this and make that decision. Don't just you know, completely drop the ball, not look at background checks at all, and at least not get to the point where you have to make that cost benefit decision. It's worth considering. But I think as Mauricio said, if it's too expensive, it probably doesn't make sense. But, you know, Jeremy, we've talked before, there are lower, lower cost uh, ways to do it now. And we've looked into some of those. Uh, A final kind of question I'd like to ask, and Mauricio uh, would, would go for you first, looking at red flags or warning signs that make you walk away from a sponsor. And at the same time, 
Have you ever come across some of those that have actually just said, you know what, I'm vetting a sponsor. Here's the red flag that I saw and I'm out. I'm walking away. I'll give you a great story that I used to, when I was younger, I would actually represent limited partners and I would review people's documents sort of as, because they wanted me to take a look at the documents. I don't do that anymore. And a couple of instances came across my desk where they didn't even have the documents. Like they didn't have a PPM. They didn't have a private place memorandum. And they came up with some excuse that just didn't make any sense. And I told them, hey, look, they're supposed to have a private place memorandum because you have some non-accredited investors, which is sort of people who are not high net worth, which require a PPM. And that to me was a red flag. Anytime you're cutting core Corners and not providing a PPM when you're supposed to, if you're cutting corners there, where else are you cutting corners? And in those two examples, uh, they ended up having fraudulent activity uh, in their deals. And so that to me is one of them, not having the, and I've heard all the stories of why I don't need a PPM or why I don't need that. That's going to be number one. Uh, and then another red flag for me, sort of on the more on the LP side and less on the legal, is just, just, just the sponsors not having sufficient skin in the game, meaning they haven't put money, their own money at risk to go alongside the investors. Because what happens typically if you don't have money in the deal, especially if the deal isn't going well, the incentive structure I don't think is aligned with, with the LPs. And so if the sponsor has you know, a significant amount, maybe not a significant amount, but a five or 10% of the, of the deal with their own money, then that, that I think uh, is important for, for the alignment. I'm seeing a lot of issues that are popping up right now where sponsors are not necessarily doing what's in the best interest of investors, but they just don't have any skin in the game, don't have any money in it. So there's really no no risk for them. I think that the importance of creating your own box, what I call box, which is the parameters you're going to invest with, is really important for this point because, you know, I don't know if the, the correct term is really a flag, but for example, uh, if somebody is offering less than a 50-50 split to investors, and even a 50-50 split is a very high hurdle to overcome, like why would someone do that necessarily? But I see deals that are 40-60. That to me is an immediate red flag of not only am I not going to invest in that deal, but because that person is clearly trying to maximize their profits and not giving people a fair deal, even if they switch it to 60-40, which I've seen happen because they start off trying to get 40-60, it doesn't work, and then they switch it, I'm never going to invest with that person because they're having like a scarcity as opposed to abundance mentality, right? And so having your box and kind of having these minimums you're trying to hit and your parameters is very important because it can cause red flags to pop up on its own. But if you don't have that box and those parameters, you may not know that there, there would have been red flags otherwise. So really, I can't stress enough. And, and some of the ways you can achieve those parameters um, is what I call opportunity exposure. So let's say you're interested in multifamily, but you're not quite sure what splits you should be getting, what preferred return you should be getting, and all these other metrics. In your pajamas, again, you can go download a whole bunch of deals online, let's just say even with crowdfunding sites or wherever they're accessible online, and then you can lay them out in front of you, 10 deals, and look at them all and see what stands out. Just learning, that's that's one of the ways I originally learned myself, is just see what stands out in a good way and a bad way, what's market rate, what isn't market rate. And of course, you can then talk to other investors and compare notes and everything else and, and leverage the community. But creating that box is really critical to be able to understand even what the red flags are when they come up. And I'll give you a quick, uh, just sort of, um, since I do so many of these, I see a lot. I mean, most, especially in the multifamily, but even I would say across the asset classes, mobile home park, self-storage, generally speaking, a, a normal um, sort of percentage that the sponsor takes for doing the deal is more along the lines of 20 to 30 percent so you usually see sort of an 80 20 split or a 70 30 split once you get to 60 40 like you said jeremy that's that's pushing because think about it the investors are putting in sometimes 100 percent of the capital uh but sometimes they're putting in maybe 95 so they should get the line share and it's very traditional for the sponsor to pick up a two percent asset management fee and then a 20% of the product. That's kind of sort of your basic split. And again, you can get to 75, 25, 70, 30, but anything below that looks weird. And anything above that looks weird too. If, if the sponsor's only taking 15% or 10%, that's also like, why are they doing that? I would say the range is 20 to 30%. Uh, some people do it at 2% asset management fee. Some people don't. And then also an acquisition fee is pretty common too, of about 2% of, of the purchase price. Yeah, and the great thing is you can go on to PassivePockets.com and a lot of these uh, metrics and, and baselines are in the, the deal analyzer we have and some of the other educational documents. But I really want to thank you, Mauricio and Jeremy, for being on this show. It is amazing to have two experienced, sophisticated LP investors to help us figure out, you know, what's the best way to vet a sponsor. And I think the best way is to start with this episode, listen to this, and then use the resources at Passive Pocket. So guys, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Jim. Thanks again for having me and I hope this is helpful for everybody who, uh, who stayed with us. Thank you.